Good morning and welcome to each and every one of you who are here and those who are online. It is good to take time out of our busyness to be able to come on God's day to join together and worship and praise him and to remember all that he has done. I have a couple of announcements. Um, one is um, this one. I'm sure some of you know. It says, two scoops are better than one. Ben and Elisa are having twins. So drop by with your family to join us for an ice cream social in that September 18th from 2 to 4 at 174, 171 Isabella Street. What a wonderful uh, invitation as we celebrate. Also, I am uh, told that um, Ethel McEwen's uh, address will be available. Um, I don't have it with me today, but it's in the bulletin? Okay, very good. So right there, yes, yeah, second from the last, um, her uh, address in Barrie. Are there other announcements for us this morning? Thank you, Mary. Any other? Okay. Let's then go to the responsive call to worship, Psalm 96. O oh, sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord, all the earth. Sing to the Lord, bless his name. Tell of his salvation from day to day. Declare his glory among the nations, his marvelous works among all the peoples. For great is the Lord, and greatly to be praised. He is to be feared above all gods. For all the gods of the peoples are worthless idols, but the Lord made the heavens. All splendor and majesty are before him, strength and beauty in his sanctuary. Ascribe to the Lord, O families of the peoples, ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. Bring in an offering and come into his courts. Worship the Lord in the splendor of holiness, Tremble before him, all the earth. Say among the nations, the Lord reigns. Yes, the world is established. It shall never be moved. He will judge the peoples with equity. Let the heavens be glad and let the earth rejoice. Let the sea roar and all that fills it. Let the field exalt everything in it. Then shall all the trees of the forest sing for joy. Before the Lord, for he comes, for he comes to judge the earth. He will judge the world in righteousness and the peoples in his faithfulness. Amen. We go now to one of the old favorites, How Great Thou Art.
Shall we pray? Holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. You who choose to become one of us in Jesus Christ, share our sorrows and our joys. You display your greatness in the child of the manger, revealing your lordship in the master washing his disciples' feet, showing your glory in the shame of the cross. And so we praise you for your love, which is enough to embrace the universe, yet close enough to enter our hearts. Your faithfulness is new every morning. During our worship today, surprise us with your grace. Enlighten us with your spirit and speak to us in your word. That we with the rest of the church and the whole creation may praise and adore you, O God, our creator and redeemer. And we come to you humbly, Lord, because we know that we have fallen short of who you would like us to be. We know we have done wrong. We have sinned against you in our thoughts, in our words, in our deeds. We have not loved you with our whole heart, mind, and strength. And we have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. In your mercy, Lord, forgive what we have been. Amend what we are. And direct what we shall be. So that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. And as Jesus taught us, let us pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Our next hymn, My Faith Looks Up to Thee, was written by a 22-year-old man. Let's remember his words to us. Please stand.
Might need my staff to, uh, in case I take a dip. So, children, and all those young at heart, do you know a Moses? Do you know Moses? I'm hearing some, I'm seeing some nods here. Yeah. You know, um, I have a nephew, and his name is Moses. Do you think he's in the Bible? No. <laughs> Emphatic no here. And I also had a doctor once, and her name was Mrs. Moses. Do you think she's in the Bible? No. Okay. Well, what can you tell me about the Moses who is in the Bible? Was he a good person? Yeah. Did he do some things wrong? Did he make mistakes? Yeah, he was. He was a pretty human guy, wasn't he? And when God said, I have a job for you, was he the first one to put up his hand and say, pick me, pick me? No. Sometimes I feel like Moses when God asks me to do something, and I said, oh, Ed, you can find somebody else to do pulpit supply. <laughs> but God did choose Moses to do something very special. Anybody tell me what it was? And there was Moses saying, I can't do that. But God said, you can do. It is your job. I am wanting you to do that today. I am wanting you to take these Israelites who are slaves, who own no land, who have no vote, and I want you to take them to the promised land. And Moses said, who am I? And he had his staff, he was a shepherd, and he had his staff, and God said, throw your staff down on the ground. So Moses did. And what happened? You remember? Yes? It did. It turned into a stake and can you ima a snake. And can you imagine a, a, a staff like this that the shepherd would use out in the field? Can you imagine how big the snake was? It was big. And what did Moses do? He ran away. I think I would too. And then God said, pick it up by the tail. And what happened? Yeah. It turned back into a staff. So Moses knew at that point just even a little bit more about what God could do. And we're going to be talking about that later. Because when we know what God can do, then perhaps we can say, okay, God, I'll take on that, that task. I'll do what you want me to do. Always something that we remember. So we have our staff here today. I'm not sure where I put it, but we'll have it here to remind us of what God can and will do.
There is no uh, mission moment this morning, so we can go into the prayers of thanksgiving and intercession. Shall we pray again? Holy God, who hears our every prayer, send us little reminders so that we may know that you are near to us. May we see you in this world that you have created. May we see you in the faces of those who care for us and be thankful. May we, like Moses, hear your word and learn to follow your ever, you ever more closely. Almighty and merciful God, from whom comes all that is good, we praise you for your mercies, for your goodness, for your grace that sustains us, your discipline that corrects us, your patience with us, and your love that has redeemed us. Help us to be thankful for all your gifts by serving and delighting to do your will. We pray for the needs of your church, the human family, and the whole world. We pray that churches of all traditions may discover their unity in Christ and exercise their gift in service to all. We pray that the world may be freed from war and famine and disease that those who govern may exercise their power in obedience to your commands. That you will strengthen Canada to pursue just priorities so that all peoples may be reconciled, the young educated, the elderly cared for, the hungry filled, and the homeless housed, the sick comforted and healed, and that you will comfort and empower those who are facing difficulties, those who are sick, disabled, and oppressed, those who grieve, we pray to you, O oh Lord. Hear, the, hear our prayer. Merciful God, as a potter fashions a bowl from humble clay, you form us into a new creation. Shape us day by day through the cross of Christ. Speak to us now through the reading of your holy word that we may be enlightened and encouraged to know you, to love you, and to do your will. For we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I would ask John to come up and um, do our readings. <clears throat> Exodus 2 verses 1 to 10 and then Acts 7 verses 17 to 37. Now a man from the house of Levi went and took as his wife a Levite woman. The woman conceived and bore a son and when she saw that he was a fine child she hid him for three months. When she could hide him no longer she took him in it she took for him a basket made from bulrushes and daubed it with bitun and pitch. She put the child in it and placed it among the reeds by the river bank, and his sister stood at a distance to know what would be done to him. Now the daughter of Pharaoh came down to bathe at the river. 
while her young women walked along, walked beside the river. She saw the basket among the reeds and sent her servant, servant woman, and she took it. When she opened it, she saw the child, and behold, the baby was crying. She took pity on him and said, this is one of the Hebrews' children. Then his sister said to Pharaoh's daughter, shall I go and call you a nurse from the Hebrew women to nurse the child for you? And Pharaoh's daughter said to her, go. So the girl went and called the child's mother. And Pharaoh's daughter said to her, take this child away and nurse him for me, and I will give you your wages. So the woman took the child and nursed him. When the child grew older, she brought him to Pharaoh's daughter, and he became her son. Her name, she named him Moses, because, she said, I drew him out of the water. Acts 7, 17 to 37. But as the time of the promise drew near, which God had granted to Abraham, the people increased and multiplied in Egypt until there arose over Egypt another king who did not know Joseph. He dealt shrewdly with our race and forced our fathers to expose their infants so that they would not be kept alive. At this time Moses was born and he was beautiful in God's sight and he was brought up for three months in his father's house. And when he was exposed, Pharaoh's daughter adopted him and brought him up as her own son. And Moses was instructed in all the wisdom of the Egyptians, and he was mighty in his words and deeds. When he was 40 years old, it came into his heart to visit his brothers, the children of Israel. And seeing one of them being wronged, he defended the oppressed man and avenged him by striking down the Egyptian. He supposed that his brothers would understand that God was giving them salvation by his hand, but they did not understand. And on the following day, he appeared to them as they were quarreling and tried to reconcile them, saying, Men, you are brothers. Why do you wrong each other? But the man who was wronging his neighbor thrust him aside, saying, who made you a ruler and a judge over us? Do not, do you want, sorry, <laughs> do you want to kill me as you killed the Egyptian yesterday? At this retort, Moses fled and became an exile in the land of Midian, where he became the father of two sons. Now when 40 years had passed, an angel appeared to him in the wilderness of Mount Sinai in a flame of fire in a bush. When Moses saw it, he was amazed at the sight. And as he drew near to look, there came the voice of the Lord. I am the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham and of Isaac and of Jacob. And Moses trembled and did not dare to look. Then the Lord said to him, take off the sandals from your feet for the place where you are standing is holy ground. I have surely seen the affliction of my people who are in Egypt and have heard their groaning. And I have come down to deliver them. And now come, I will send you to Egypt. This Moses, whom they rejected, saying, Who made you a ruler and a judge? This man God sent as both ruler and redeemer by the hand of the angel who appeared to him in the bush. This man led them out performing wonders and signs in Egypt and at the Red Sea and in the wilderness for 40 years. This is the Moses who said to the Israelites, God will raise you up, for you are a prophet like me from your brothers. This is the word of the Lord. Faith, not fear. What I really meant was faith among fear. A little difference, and, and that is my fault. I did not get um, that uh, 
put down into, into writing as they should have. Perhaps we are all aware and familiar with the story of Moses, the fine child, the privileged prince, the man who avenged an Israelite, a shepherd, the one who became the leader of a nation, God's servant. All of these things tell us a little bit about who Moses was. But it's true that in his lifetime, Moses saw, saw how God deals with impossibilities. For often what is impossible for, for us is possible for God. Let's go back a few years. It was 430 years ago that the Israelites came to Egypt during a famine. They had no food at home and they were welcomed in Egypt. There was 70 of them. Well now, 10 plus generations later, there were so many Israelites in Egypt that the, that the powers that be were a little frightened. How could they stand up if these people decided to rise up against them? What would they do? So Pharaoh decided that baby boys should be killed. This would stop the uh, increase in the population. Under these circumstances, the possibility of Moses even living for a few hours were very small, even nil. But God worked through five women to save this child, to bring him to adulthood. Every mom thinks that their child is fine, is wonderful looking, but that Moses' mother seemed to see something a little more than just being a fine child. She decided that she would keep him. So she kept him for three months at home when he was small and perhaps not crying very much, no one would hear him. And then she put, made a basket and put him in the basket. He was put in the Nile River and his sister was sent to keep an eye on him to make sure he was okay. But he was discovered by the Pharaoh's servants as they walked up and down the Nile and one of them went in and brought him out. You remember the story. And even the Pharaoh's daughter was so very concerned for this child. She knew it was a Hebrew child. She knew why it was there to hide it, but she was concerned and she felt compassion. And so Miriam, who was there watching, asked her if she could find a nurse for the baby. And she did. Can you see one kind of miraculous situation building on another, on another, on another? To have Moses live through all of this. Well, Miriam went and found her mother. And the Pharaoh's daughter talked to the mother saying, would you take this child and nurse this child. And when he is older, bring him to me. And that's what happened. You know, fear is a very strong feeling. It can stop us and paralyze us in our tracks. Anxiety can just overwhelm us when we look at the big picture. 
The Bible more than once has said, do not be afraid, do not fear. We think of Mary when she was told that she would have a child, her unmarried. And we are reminded again and again that when we keep our focus on God or on Jesus, not worry about all the big picture, all the what ifs or the woulda, coulda, shouldas we have, that God will take us to where he wants us to go. We choose faith, as did Moses' mother, the midwives, and his sister. Well, the story continues, doesn't it? And in, in it are all these little miracles which you see happening. From the royal court, Moses ventures out to see his brothers. He sees an Egyptian beating an Israelite man, and he takes things into his own hands. He doesn't say, what should I do, God? He says, this is what I'm going to do. Then he sees two men fighting, and he can't quite understand why. Here they are. They're, they're, they are literally brothers. They are both Israelites. But from that, he finds out that he has been seen. His deed of slaying the Egyptian has known. He will be called before the Pharaoh, and it won't be pretty. So, what does he do? He leaves behind all that's familiar, and he goes to Meridian, where he lives as a foreigner, and eventually has a home and a family. His life changes. We can't really understand how great that change was for him. From being served, having servants, he then learns to serve others. From the princely robes that he wore, he now wears homespun. From being cared for, he now cares for others and shepherds his sheep. From the palace to the wilderness, for one who had some authority to one who was a hired hand. He learns the Midian customs, and here again we see God working because their customs were very similar to those that Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob would have lived with. So inadvertently, he learns about his own ancestors. Another gift from God for Moses. But in all his 40 years in Midian, he had never seen a bush with flames coming out of it, and yet the bush was not burning up. And there was a voice coming from the flame, calling his name, Moses, Moses. And he responds, here I am. The God who had gone to Egypt with Jacob now speaks to Moses. See, God also had heard the cry of the Israelites. And like Moses, he knew the suffering. And now was the time to rescue them from the hand of the Egyptian. It was God's appointed time. What a difference between God's appointed time and our timing. Moses had tried taking things into his own hands, and he had failed. And on top of all of this, wonders on wonders, he 
He wants God to lead his people. But, God, but Moses needed convincing. He knew he had made mistakes. He had never pretended to be perfect, yet he was the one that God had chosen. Behind all his excuses were the questions, did he really have the ability to do this, to face the powerful Moses, or Pharaoh? Yes, there was a new, new Pharaoh there, but they had records and they could dig them up and they would know who he was and what he'd done. And God knew what he had done. Why would God want him to do this task? He had never been a leader. Could he do that? It was one thing to lead sheep to green pastures, quite another to lead people who did not know the wilderness Lead them to the promised land. But God told him, take off your sandals. You are standing on holy ground. And Moses was afraid to look at God. Fear of failure, fear of inability, lack of skills, he brought them to God. Fear can really hold us back. Fear of new opportunities. Fear of new challenges ahead, perhaps, as some leave school or go to new schools. We like to be comfortable. We like to know what's going to happen tomorrow and kind of gauge our day towards it. Sometimes we are confronted with things that we don't know how to react to, and fear can hold us back. I want to tell you a story about my own life, and some of you will know part of it. A few years ago now, I was with a mission trip to Nicaragua. And uh, one of the things on the agenda was that we were to visit a prison, a men's prison. We were to make a little presentation, take it to the prison, and um, bring the word of God in that way to these men. Now this was a huge prison, and there was hundreds and hundreds of prisoners. When we got in there, it was very dark. And as we made our way to the stage area, one of the young people said, um, there's something wrong here, let's get out. And as we made our way towards the door, towards the door we were swarmed. I don't know if you've ever been swarmed, but it's an awful feeling of being surrounded by people and they were, they were poking at us, they were pulling out earrings, they were doing that sort of stuff. This is how a mission trip should not go. And it was frightening. And I tell you that not, not because um, it's really about mission trips. It was about me and my fear and the fear of others. Fear so that I did not want to go into another prison, whether it was in Nicaragua or elsewhere. Fear that what could have happened could have been worse. I was there with my daughter. Fear that, that 
this prison was for me um, that I just wanted to get out of my life and out of my mind. Well, I was on another mission trip and their agenda was to go to a prison. And I thought, oh, oh, in trouble. <laughs> Think I'll sit in the car. <laughs> well, they are doing this. But they told me this is a different situation altogether. It is outside, it is a few people, and we are bringing them mats so that they can sleep, and I think it was soap and, and a few things like that. And I thought, I'll sleep in the car. I'll, I'll just stay in the car. However, I did end up going in. And the fear that I'd held for so long disappeared. I still kept my, my back to the wall so that nobody could sneak up behind me. But, I, but even that lessened. And one of the fellows there made a bracelet for me. And I, I took it, and I still have it. Because I remember at that point that my fear was real, but perhaps misguided. In that with the help of my friends and with God, I went and it was a wonderful time of ministry, of seeing others through different eyes. Faith amid fear. We see that in Moses too. In his questions to God, what if they don't believe me? Well, God, as we said this morning, Moses had his staff and it was, throw down your staff and it becomes a snake, pick up by the tail and it becomes a staff again. God could do that just like that. The staff was a tangible reminder to Moses and to the Israelites of God's ability to do the impossible. And Moses was on his way. In our church, we usually don't have a shepherd's crook, but we do have the burning bush as a symbol, as a reminder for us of what God can do. A bush that has the flames of, flames of fire coming out of it, but it does not burn up. The cross on this, on this pulpit fall is the cross of St. Andrew's. A reminder that Andrew, a fisherman, was a disciple of Jesus. We need these reminders often in our lives. Our reminders that God is with us. Reminders of what God is capable of doing, is able to do, and will do at the moment, at the right moment, in his time. Have you ever wondered if your faith is strong enough for the circumstances that you face? I want to, uh, I came across a little 
devotional, actually, that a fellow called Daniel McGuinness <clears throat> wrote, and it was called Bring What You Have. Now, he was doing this in regards to the feeding of the 5,000, but it's, it's true for us all even today. Bring what you have. He says, Jesus, with Jesus, the little that we have is more than enough. Remember that. Daniel confesses that I often feel God's calling is well beyond me. But this story is about God's ability to multiply the little that we can offer. He calls us to the impossible, to accomplishing more than we ever thought or could imagine. I am sure that Moses thought that he had little to offer, but he did end, he did end up offering what he had. But Daniel continues, he said, if we're not living for something impossible beyond our own ability, our vision is too small. Wow, think of that. Something beyond our own ability. Like the disciples, our only response is to bring what we have, the simple gifts, experiences, personality traits, and faith. We bring those. And as with the feeding of the 5,000, the abundance left after the great feast speaks to his ability, God's ability, to do more and beyond what we ask or imagine. Bring what you have, inadequate as it may seem, and see what God will do. See what God did with Moses as he traveled from Midian to Egypt where he spars with the Pharaoh. to the Red Sea where they walk through the dry riverbed, to the promised land. All this is very true and pertinent for us. Moses didn't have control over the first part of his life. He did not choose his family or his time in the palace. But it was God who put all of these things, all of the experiences that he had together. It was fear that brought him to Midian, but he settled there and he became quite comfortable as we become quite comfortable these days. He was comfortable until he met God on that holy ground. I wonder if God is asking you to do something, something impossible, something that you could never do on your own. This church is really in an uproar where there is uncertainty. What is it that you can do to serve God? The list is lengthy. Perhaps you are thinking about helping in Sunday school or joining a Bible study, or you would like to have more time for prayer. Find a prayer partner. Learn how to share your faith. These are just a few of the many, many things that God asks us to do. 
And when he asks us, when we say yes, he honors us. And he guides us. And he equips us. Sometimes we just need to sit down with a trusted friend to be able to talk about these things. Or sit down with Pastor Ed there. What is God asking you to do? Remember faith amid fear and go forward. Amen. I want to introduce a, uh, I think, a new hymn. It's uh, one that's in the uh, 1972 hymn book. It is called Lead Me, Lord. I think what we'll do is uh, we will go through it uh, three times just to kind of get the hang of it. First of it is to just try and get the tune and then uh, a couple of more times to kind of cement that tune into our heads. Please stand. Please be seated. Heavenly Father, as we learn more about you and all that you do, we give thanks that you are a God of might and a God of compassion that you take us from where we are and you lead us to grow in our faith, 
to grow in our understanding and to grow in our love for you. Your goodness abounds, Lord. Help us to know your timing and to wait. Help us always that we may be your children. We pray in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior. Amen. Faye, I guess you're elected again to bring up the offering. You give us so much, Lord, and from all that you have given us, we give back to you for the work of your church, for the ministry of the people, for the blessing of God. Amen. Let's remain standing for our last hymn, Great is Thy Faithfulness. Go with the courage and strength and faith of God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, this day, until Christ returns or we meet him in the sky, and then forevermore. Amen.